Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for joining us. I'm Stephen Richman, and I'm vice chair of Cypark Institutional Investor Practice. Uh, I'm joined on the call by my colleagues in the investments practice, as well as by David Bazaar and Bill Hanlon. If you have any questions during the course of the presentation, please feel free to add them to the chat feature of WebEx. David Bazaar has represented bank liquidating trusts for the FDIC as receiver and purchasers of the assets of FDIC bank receiverships who stood in the shoes of the FDIC. He chairs Cypher's consumer financial services practice and has been representing financial institutions and business clients in bank regulatory litigation and insolvency matters for more than 25 years. Bill Hanlon is chair of Cypher's bankruptcy department and has practiced for over 30 years and is a veteran of numerous bank failures. Uh, David and Bill are jointly leading Cypher's SVP signature bank uh, and hopefully not growing too much beyond that task force. As a general disclaimer, before we get started, please note that the content discussed on this call is intended for general information purposes only. You are urged to consult with your CIFARC attorney or other legal advisor concerning your own situation and any specific legal questions specific to your organization that you may have. Um, and with that, out of the way, I'm going to turn it over to David and Bill. Good afternoon, all. Um, we thought that uh, it would be appropriate to just do a general rundown on the status of the FDIC receiverships and uh, then turn to uh, questions of particular interest to the institutional investment community. Um, and the, the first question we're planning to cover is what has changed? Um, and I guess uh, the uh, short answer is, is mostly everything since Friday. Um, on uh, Friday, when um, when uh, SVB was taken over and put into receivership, uh, we were told that uh, uh, $250,000 per depositor would be available on Monday morning and a little else. Uh, FDIC guidance was issued over the weekend. The FDIC conducted a uh, failed auction for um, uh, for SVB's uh, assets over the weekend, and um, at uh, and then Sunday, Signature Bank, uh, a New York commercial bank, was closed by uh, state authorities and put into receivership by the FDIC, um, as recommended by the FDIC, the Federal Reserve, uh, and the President of the United States. Uh, Treasury Secretary Yellen approved actions enabling the FDIC to complete its resolution of Silicon Valley Bank in a manner that fully protects all depositors. In other words, depositors got their cash today, uh, not uh, just the $250,000 insured piece, but all of their money. Um, and the banks were, uh, the bank was brought back online. Similar actions have been approved by, um, with respect to Signature Bank. Um, a word on mechanics. Um, the FDIC has transferred all deposits, uh, both insured and uninsured, and all the assets of the former Silicon Valley Bank and the former Signature Bank to newly created FDIC-operated bridge banks. Um, that is designed uh, to protect all depositors of both of those banks. Um, again, mechanically, um, the FDIC banks are up and running, online and ATM services and check writing is available, and uh, the bank's official checks will continue to clear, and um, the FDIC has advised their loan customers to continue paying their loans. Anything to add on mechanics, David? Not to that. Okay. 
Um, so I'm going to ask you a question. Is this a bailout? <laughs> I guess it depends on your definition of bailout. Um, it, it's not a traditional bailout in the sense that, so the equity holders of the institution are going to, are, are, both institutions are likely to be wiped out completely. So, so they're not getting a bailout. Um, the, um, the, uh, the government is going to have to, as part of its backstop of these institutions, is going to have to fund them. That that has to come from the treasury. So those are treasury funds. They're they're doing that pursuant to their emergency powers to contain the contagion. Uh, but that money has to come from somewhere uh, because these institutions were insolvent. So where it'll come from in the short term is that the, some of the operating funds of the financial institution. Um, eventually, the, the the funds that just went in are, are probably government funds. Uh, that they just uh, backstopped all of the deposits that weren't there. So they're going to have to get that from somewhere. It'll come from um, uh, imposing a, a, a surcharge on the uh, on the banks that uh, pay into the, the, the fund that they do the insurance fund for. So that eventually gets passed on in theory to the uh, the banking public, which in, are another form of taxpayer, except that it's to the banks instead of the government treasury. And then the federal government may sue of uh, the officers and directors of the failed financial institutions under their authority under FIREA uh, to uh, to attempt to recover monies that way. Okay, that sounds like it's going to run out over a period of time. Um, and uh, it, it'll be, uh, be interesting to see the litigation when it arises. Um, but for right now, uh, we have two new banks and um, the FDIC named um, Tim Neopolis, Neopolis, excuse me, as CEO of Silicon Valley Bank. Um, Mr. Mayopolis is the former president and CEO of Fannie Mae and uh, served as uh, president of Blend Labs, Inc., a fintech company. I don't know whether uh, Blend Labs does business with Silicon Valley Bank or not. Uh, it wasn't in the report. Um, and the FDIC also named Greg Carmichael as CEO of Signature Bank. Mr. Carmichael is the former CEO of Fifth Third Bank Corp. Um, and uh, these gentlemen are charged with running the bridge banks. Uh, we anticipate that uh, many of the, the, the same employees that were uh, staffing the banks on Friday are staffing the banks today. Um, we also anticipate that um, uh, in the nature of a bridge bank, the bridge banks will close down at some unspecified point in the future, and that uh, those employees um, may be sharpening their pencils and updating their resumes as we speak um, with uh, uncertainty about the duration of the bank. Um, What do we expect will happen today, David, um, to, uh, to to the deposits that the government has backed? Well, so the, the deposits have all have all been returned. Um, so, regardless of insured limits, everybody has access to their deposit funds at this time. You think they're going to keep them in? <laughs> so, that's such a good question. So, it, it, there's there's two types of uh, of customers of the bank right now. Willing and unwilling. <laughs> okay, so so the the a lot of them are going to be unwilling. Uh, there's a lot of folks who are not going to want to put up with the administrative nightmare of of dealing with the FDIC as receiver, um, even though it's it's through an operating bank that's supposed to be all by itself new bank. Um, it's still nonetheless run as a receivership. So uh, folks will start uh, bleeding out. They'll take their those who can take their deposits without. Potentially breaching a loan covenant with the bank. So if they they had a loan with the bank and they had to maintain their uh, deposits as part of the bank's collateral agreement, then they can't just leave. But but those who can will, will start taking their deposits with them and their banking relationships with them, um, and look for more stable uh, and permanent services from somebody that they trust. Uh, also, the employees are going to start leaving because. They're going to be concerned that they don't know what's going to happen to their jobs and, and if they can find a job in the interim that's permanent, a lot of them will go. So, the FDIC has a statutory mandate with respect to the bank's assets, doesn't it? Yeah. So, the statutory mandate is to maximize the value of the failed bank to the taxpayer. And, and it's very particular about the requirements 
they're, they're required to, to act with deliberate speed uh, in attempting to sell off the, uh, the bank as an ongoing concern. And then if that fails, which it's already failed, we know for Signature Bank yesterday when they conducted an auction, um, not, I'm sorry, Silicon Valley Bank when they conducted an auction, uh, then they're, they're required to start thinking about breaking it up into pieces and selling it off that way. Um, it, it, you know, whether it, it, it causes uh, damage to the, the bank's customers isn't really as much of their statutory mandate. They've, they've got to maximize the value of the asset to the, to the taxpayer. And I think that's going to be a, uh, a significant guidepost to the FDIC's uh, decision making with respect to fulfilling bank functions. Right. So, so like we watched this whipsaw, like really whipsaw, because when they first closed the institution down, they came out and they said, uh, it's, it's, you know, you get $250,000 back. That's it. Sorry about your deposits. Keep paying your loans. Uh, we're going to reopen the bank branches for, for le very limited service purposes on Monday. That was, that was Friday, Saturday and Sunday. And then on Sunday, when the second bank failed and the uh, federal government uh, writ large decided to exercise its extraordinary powers under its contagion authority, um, then, then that all changed and they said, okay, never mind. we're going to form a full purpose bank. We're going to continue to service it as a, as a real bank. We're going to bring in real bank CEOs. Uh, don't go anywhere. Everything's going to be fine. Full faith and credit of the United States and we're going to operate these institutions. That only goes so far because the next whipsaw will be, and we've done X with the asset that's coming soon because they have got to do that with great speed. So they're either going to sell it off wholesale to a buyer if they can find one, or they're going to start selling off chunks of things. So, you know, that you'll get a notice like, okay, your bank was this. Well, now your bank is that, and we're going to transition over to this new, this new bank. That'll be the goal, uh, the whole thing at once if they can, but if they can't, maybe they just sell the loans off separately from from the deposits or whatever, it'll, it'll be, it'll be fascinating to watch it unfold. Yeah. And perhaps it'll be sold in tranches or in uh, yep. groups. Um, uh, this is, uh, this is kind of an old school approach, isn't it? Yeah. So this is the, yeah, exactly. So those of us who've been around a long time, uh, back, back, uh, in the, uh, the late eighties, early nineties, when they had the SNL, uh, crisis, which, you know, I started, I started, Bill's been doing this about five years longer than me. I came into this in, in, uh, the very early, the early nineties. Um, uh, this is exactly how they used to do the thing, do this thing in the old days. And, uh, what they didn't do in the 2008 financial crisis, they're now going back to, um, the original recipe. Yeah. So, um, I, you know, I think kind of in, in, in summary, I mean, they're, they're the unwilling, um, uh, customers of Silicon Valley and Signature Bank are um, uh, customers that are bound to the bank by loan balances, lockbox agreements, deposit agreements, um, and, um, and 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 the like. And 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 um, in some of the uh, the, the kinkier um, uh, financial agreements, which Silicon Valley Bank was known to accommodate. Um, and it's going to be difficult for them to extricate themselves to it from that. Um, in the best of all worlds, the bank gets sold by uh, to an entrepreneurial purchaser who fully staffs up and hires and services the heck out of these loans. Uh, in the worst of all worlds, um, the, the assets get sold to uh, a, a less enthusiastic purchaser um, who um, uh, doesn't service them well and, uh, and, and causes great inconvenience, delay, and expense to the bank's customers. So I haven't talked about this anywhere else but for, yet, but for this audience, and this, I think maybe they find this interesting. So, so to Bill's point, you know, the, these two banks were kind of special, they were special purpose banks, you know, one really focused on the tech industry, the other one focused on crypto. And, and so they have a clientele that may not be that comfortable to a lot of the more traditional banks, you know, that, that, that they're going to feel exposed in buying, um, a, a, a sectors that they may not be that comfortable with, uh, as, as sectors. So they're going to look at the appreciation of risk a little bit differently. 
Um, that, you know, they may or may not have something to do with why PN, PNC, PNC stepped forward and then stepped out once they sort of really got a look at the books and what that might look like. Um, but it's going to present a huge challenge, I think, to, uh, to, to, the, to the FDIC in trying to figure out how to sell this, these, these, these non-traditional banks, in a sense, to more traditional lenders. It's going to be, you know, that, that's part of the problem. Well, yeah, you know, and, and for example, uh, you know, sub subscription lending, um, that's a fairly specialized uh, form of lending. Um, and, uh, and we're, we're, we're not certain um, how long, um, if at all, the bridge banks will continue to advance under their subscription lines of credit. Right. So, so to Bill's point, so right now we've been able to verify with at least one client that um, their line is supposed to be available for draw. They haven't drawn on it yet, so they weren't able to say that they actually got, you know, it's like, do you, do you actually have the money? <laughs> it's, it's kind of the keystone here, but, uh, but, but they, you know, supposedly they've been assured that they can get access to the funds. But, you know, the problem with dealing with the FDIC as receiver is, is that, and we've seen this already happen twice. The, the, the today's guidance is not necessarily the rest of today's guidance, let alone tomorrow's guidance. It could change on a dime when they make a decision that, nope, not in the interest of the taxpayer anymore, then they're statutorily obligated to stop. So it's, it's just completely unreliable. Uh, and so I think at a minimum, uh, those who are, uh, are, are customers of these banking institutions, if they're reliant on a line of credit or other, other, um, uh, Aspects of the relationship, they need to have a backup plan in case it stops. Right, uh, you know, hope for the best, plan for the worst. Um, uh, you know, somebody is going to find um, uh, the, the, these banking lines uh, interesting, and hopefully, uh, uh, a purchaser with an entrepreneurial bent will come along and purchase them. But uh, it, it's. It, it, it may not happen, and um, and at some point, and we don't know when that point is, um, the, uh, the 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 bridge banks will no longer be bridge banks; they will be uh, liquidating banks, and uh, and and the um, uh, the music will stop, and somebody everybody's got to try and find a seat. Um, yeah, yeah, bridge bridge bank literally means <laughs> to get us to the liquidating bank. <laughs> Like, like that. This is not going to last long, right? Um, so, you know, I mean, that's obviously going to affect um, private equity funds' uh, ability to do business. I mean, you know, the, the GPs are dependent on subscription lines to avoid going out again and again to their um, limited partners for for draws. And uh, you know, I, I suppose they, you know, the the, the plan D. Might be to go out to their limited partners uh, every other week and and uh, request a draw, but uh, they, they they certainly uh, should have a plan B or plan C, which is start talking to other lenders about replacing the line of credit that they have with these existing banks. Right. Um, Hopefully, you won't need it, but you know that old expression of better than to have it and not need it than to need it and not have it. So how, how about how about somebody with a, a, a nice juicy low interest rate loan from uh, one of these banks? Uh, should should they leave it there? So if you have a closed end mortgage, meaning meaning you got all your money up front, and it's on a really nice low interest rate that you cannot match today, then that's a loan you may want to hold on to for dear life. Uh, because it's in your financial interest to hold on to it. Um, you are in the superior position in the fact that you already have the money and all you have is an obligation to repay it in, over time and in, in periodic payments. So uh, so that is not you know, necessarily a loan you want to let go of. The, the downside for you may be the covenants that tell you you have to keep your deposits with this institution. Those are valuable deposits to whoever the purchaser is going to be. And so one would expect that that they're uh, going to continue to maintain those posits in the second way. Plus, we've already seen the government stand behind them, so it's not going to, it's not going to allow them to be dissipated by the buyer. So, uh, you know, you're in a pretty good position 
uh, that way. And uh, it, we're really more concerned about those folks who have the line of credit issue that, um, you know, they need to need to make draws on and those are uh, those are uh, not reliable uh, as we would like to see. So that's the type of question that a um, general partner should expect to get from the limited partner advisory committee. Um, and, uh, and, you know, the, the, the other questions will be, you know, what the hell were we doing at Silicon Valley Bank to begin with? Um, why wasn't this monitored better? Um, when, 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 did, when did you first find out that Silicon Valley Bank was going to fail? Um, the the, the uh, uh, trick question, if you will. Right. I started uh, filling calls Friday night. I mean, I, the, the call started rolling into me uh, like around 6 p.m. Uh, uh, Central Time on Friday with panicked uh, CEO suite type saying, uh, you know, the C-suite type saying, I, should I withdraw my funds? I'm going to have to breach for certain things to withdraw them. Should I get them? And my, having seen a couple of bank runs in my career, the, my advice was, oh, yeah, get your, don't worry about any of that. Cash, cash is king, get your cash, worry about everything else later. Uh, that turned out to be good advice for those clients that I talked to who actually got money out um, on, on Friday, like late in the day. But then it, then after that, the systems went uh, down. That was Thursday, right? Thursday. Right, Thursday. Like the day, before whatever the day before that. I, you know, I've been working like literally every minute since I've been awake. So whatever, I, the days are bleeding together since the thing started. But you know, whenever, when the day before the thing went down, I started fielding phone calls. You're right. It was Thursday. Thursday. Right. And uh, and Thursday is when forty two billion dollars was withdrawn from um, the bank. Uh, so uh, I, I, I I suspect that there were a lot of people giving the same advice, which was get your money out now while you can. Anybody who knew what they were doing, it's like get your, get your cash. You know, it's like you have, you have two hundred fifty thousand dollars of insurance. Get your cash. So yeah. So uh, you know, was it wasn't um, you know Dot Frank supposed to prevent this sort of uh, occurrence? Huh. Uh, yeah. Well, they raised the the capital requirements and said, oh, we're, we're all we're all good now. But capital requirements have nothing to do with with the bank run, because because what ends up happening with a, a run on a bank is that the depositors, when they make the run and they say, well, we want our deposits back and the financial institutions like, but I don't have them. I, I, I all that money's out doing good things for the bank in the world. It's not sitting in your account. That's like an IOU on demand. So, you know, and, and there were depository institutions. So there's no way to adequately capitalize a depository institution against the bank run. So no, but Maybe a lot, maybe a lot of, you know, quote unquote experts thought that. Well, our concerns about contagion have switched from COVID to bank failure. Um, and, uh, and what, what, what do you think uh, is, is going to happen if uh, uh, another, uh, another bank fails? So I think it's a matter of timing. If another bank fails like now this week, uh, I would expect the government to treat them the same way that it treated the last two because it's still in contagion uh, uh, avoidance mode and um, whatever would have happened this week is systemic and uh, it's going to be an easy call for the, the, the federal regulators to say, okay, now we have two, now we have three, and, and to really step forward and say, you know, we're, we're taking additional steps to shore up the banking system so you'll see even more. Uh, federal government resources thrown at it if, if, if this doesn't work. Um, but they sure, they're not going to stop. So the, the likelihood of, of, uh, of, a, of a bank failing this week because the feds didn't do enough is extremely non-existent, really, uh, my humble opinion. Um, but, um, you know, at, over time, uh, then this, this, this uh, crisis will have averted. And then if there's another failure, they'll have to look at it um, more from what it is as opposed to what this is right now. So we've been asked um, uh, about um, how uh, money market sweep accounts are impacted by uh, a bank failure. Um, would, would you like to address that? No, but I'm going to. 
You're the man. Good job. So it's so complicated. I'm going to just try to keep it simple for this audience. And then if anybody has any questions about this that they're worried about, just follow up with us by email. Um, if you just Google me, David Bazaar, I'm Cyforth. You can, my email address right there, you can just email me. Um, but, but here's the sort of very short oversimplified answer. So, so it, it really depends on if it's a depository account within of whatever nature uh, within the, uh, the, the, um, the bank. Uh, funds on deposit. It doesn't really matter what category they're in. There's 14 categories of funds that the FDIC insures. They're insured up to the 250K um, if an institution were to fail, but now we know the chances are the Fed would throw more money at it for right now. Um, if they are tr certain types of identifiable trust funds, they get treated under a different rule. They're still insured. They're actually potentially more insured. Um, and um, uh, the, it, there's a tool called EDIE -E -E that is on the FDIC website. And um, you can run the, all the account information through that tool and it will tell you precisely, it should, exactly what the insurance coverage limits are. Thanks, David. Um, uh, you know, one of, uh, one, of, one, of, one of our colleagues commented that Signature has a uh, strong presence in the real estate industry. And uh, one of the questions that they fielded earlier today was, um, what, what should I do if, if Signature is my depository bank, but my lender is somewhere, somewhere else? Um, and, uh, and, I, and I think that's a, a pretty simple um, a solution. So I'll, I'll handle that one. Um, the, uh, the, you go, go, go to your servicer and ask for uh, a new depository account, um, a new bank to handle your tenants' deposits, uh, if you will, um, because uh, they're, they're not going to be uh, your, 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 your other lender is not going to be anxious to uh, have a uh, bridge bank uh, be the depository. So you should get cooperation on that point. Um, uh, what about letters of credit? We've been asked uh, whether letters of credit will be uh, honored here. Yeah, I knew you were going to ask me that one, um, and I was hoping you wouldn't, but I knew you would. So, um, so letters of credit are weird. Um, they are, uh, they can be repudiated by the FDIC as receiver, quote, within a reasonable time period, unquote, pursuant to uh, 12 United States Code Section 1821E2. And, and that reasonable period is running right now. And, and we don't know what the FDIC is going to do with respect to outstanding letters of credit. They are, they would be a liability against the United States if it pays it out of U.S. funds that they don't want to do. Um, at the, at the same time, you know, they may have an interest in assuring, uh, because they've now called this a, a real operated bank, you know, that's a, this is not the usual scenario where anymore, where they say, um, you know, we're just going to do limited as limited as possible. They've now said, we're going to max, you know, we think it's different. We're going to maximize the value by making it operational, you know. What I would say is, is that unless you get some type of adequate assurance of performance uh, actively from the uh, from the FDIC that it is going to back its letter of credits, your letter of credit, because which it hasn't said yet, I've not seen that anywhere, and I've looked for it. Um, unless they come out and say that in writing, I, I would get a new letter of credit um, because they're just not it's not reliable, and they they can repudiate. So and, and let me put that in clearer terms. So a lot of us are used to this for like more for bankruptcies that, you know, you can, um, you know, there's a trustee avoidance powers and things and all that. This is, this is sort of similar, but it's out of court. It's all not non-judicial and it's just because the government does it. So they can just by fiat say, we're, we're, nope, we don't, we don't want to honor this letter of credit. So it's not really a letter of credit until you get an, an assurance of performance that they will actually do it. Yeah, and, and chances are that assurance is not going to be forthcoming. Right. Um, 
uh, you know, we may get a temporary assurance here. And there was a mention that, um, uh, you know, qualified um, financial uh, uh, contracts will be honored in one of the FDIC's releases. Um, and that covers things like swap agreements and, uh, and, and the like, uh, securities contracts, repurchase agreements, et cetera. Um, but there's, there's no guarantee for how long that's going to last. Um, we, and, we just and don't Bill have and I, to... Yeah, Bill and I have had the same experience that we've talked about extensively that like, you can't trust the FDIC uh, because they, 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 half the time they'll come back and say, oh, I, I'm sorry, I didn't have the authority. When I, I just didn't have the authority. So you, you have to, you know, or they just change their mind and it just, it is now it's different. So, so the only thing that you can really rely on are enforceable written commitments from the FDIC, nothing else you can really, you know, so, so when they go out on their website and they publish on their website, whatever they publish on their website is good until they change it even, which we've seen since, you know, since since last Friday. Another question we have here, David, is um, uh, whether limited partner advisory committee members should be asking questions of general partners who might, might either bank at SVB or be invested in portfolio companies that bank at SVB. Um, and I think the easy answer to that is Yes, um, uh, you know, I, I think general partners should expect um, uh, and, and be prepared to defend their decision to bank with S SVB or to invest in portfolio companies that did their banking with SVB. Um, and, and, um, and, and, you know, chances are that they will be uh, uh, Evaluated under the business judgment standard, um, and uh, and there were a lot of good reasons to uh, to, to bank with SVB, particularly for uh, startup and venture uh, and 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 other uh, companies that required more flexible uh, financial arrangements than were conventionally available. I would say all you have to do is look at their list of customers. That are well, very publicly known now because of the deposit issues, and it's pretty easy to justify having used them as as a bank. I mean, it's it's you're in really good company if you're in that sector, particularly. Yes. Um, another question we have here is: if one is invested in SVB either directly on the cap table or through a fund that has a position with SVB. Do we have any remedies or should we be looking at avenues of potential recovery? I, our gut feeling here is that the equity in SVB is going to be wiped out. Um, and uh, are, are there other avenues of recovery? Um, I, I, at this point, it's a, it's a it's a little early to say, but you know, to your point, David, there were a lot of people that trusted SVB, a lot of people that trusted um, uh, Signature, and there were a lot of people that trusted the rating agencies that rated um, uh, both banks, and, uh, uh, and and you know, the feedback that we've had um, from clients is, uh, you know, bank failure was not on our radar. Um, this, this really did catch a lot of people by surprise. Now, I mean, in hindsight, which of course is 2020, um, should, should, uh, should people have been alarmed with um, uh, SVB's practice of investing in low interest bonds or parking their money in low interest bonds in a rising interest environment, uh, uh, perhaps. But uh, uh, that's, um, I, I think, something to be uh, fought out in the courts. Um, and and I, don't, I don't think we can give uh, uh, guidance on that here. No, I, I would just add to that. I mean, the institution failed when it had a run of a quarter of its deposits 
roughly within a 24 hour period, that, that would take down a lot of banks. Um, so, um, it, you know, it's, it's a very challenging environment. The other thing I'd point out too is, uh, that we haven't mentioned yet is, so when you have a claim against the institution, um, there's a claims process, an administrative claims process through the FDIC, part of FIREA. You get, you only get 90 days to, to make a claim. It's, so it's not like a lawsuit. You can't just go sue and just would encourage everybody to make sure that they count, they get, uh, competent counsel, uh, about, about how to knowing whether they need to file a claim and, and making the claim because they get extinguished. Uh, if you need to make one after that 90 day period, it's 90 days that runs from the date of the publication of the failure, which, you know, was this Sunday for, uh, for, uh, was it both banks or, uh, no, signature was this Sunday. So if we, if we measure from, uh, uh Friday, when Friday, right, uh, Friday and Sunday, SVB failed. Um, it claims against SBB have to be filed um, in this administrative process. Um, I think by June eighth is roughly ninety days, um, and um, uh, you know, the, the based based on based on our prior experience with the FDIC and their administrative process, um, this is it uses more of an excuse for not paying claims than an actual adjudication. So you file your claim, it gets denied, and then you got to go to court. Um, if you go to court first, they say, well, you haven't exhausted your administrative remedies. Oops, it's been 120 days. So you can't exhaust your <laughs> administrative remedies and you have no remedy. Um, you know, here the, uh, the, 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 the chance of needing to file a claim has been reduced substantially by the uh, government coming in and funding the deposits. Um, uh, you know, but uh, it, 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 it's, it's, uh, it's not on this week's to-do list, but evaluating the claims may be on next month's to-do list. Right. I mean, every, in theory, everything that the, uh, the bank owed everyone for everything uh, that they hadn't paid yet is claimable. And so if they don't come out and guarantee in writing saying, oh, we're not we're paying that, you don't need to file a claim, you know, that type of category of whatever it is. Um, you know, for example, if you if you provide services to the bank, your vendor service provider, they haven't paid you and, uh, and, and, and you think, okay, they'll just pay me next month. No, you have to file a claim now uh, to guarantee your payment um, if you even get it at all. Uh, and maybe they'll maybe they'll just pay it out of the goodness of their heart and all that, but they they don't have to. Right. So that's a vendor as opposed to a depositor. Yeah, I'm just saying that the that, that uh, yeah, I was using that as an example of somebody who might need to file a claim. Um, I think we've run through um, the 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 questions that we've had brought to our attention before the uh, webinar, and I don't see any other additional ones in our Q&A column. Um, so uh, I, I'd like to give the attendees back part of their day um, and, uh, and wrap things up here. Um, any um, any, any uh, last comments, David? Uh, so we've, we've formed a... Uh... Uh, a rapid reaction task force here at the firm. And oh, I see one question, we'll go ahead and answer that in a second. Uh, we've, we've formed a, a rapid reaction task force here at the firm that is uh, just a, it's a large number of attorneys with substantial subject matter expertise in all these areas. So if we can be of any help to anyone out there, we would we would be pleased to. Uh, and we're, very, we're being very timely. We're, we're answering every question that comes in pretty much instantaneously. Uh, so, uh, uh, we're, we're happy to help people. And then I guess, Bill, there was one question that just came, um, which was, uh, what about bank checks uh, and wires issued pre-takeover and uh, not yet cleared, honored in the normal course? So, so that's one thing they put up on their website that said that they're gonna continue to honor checks and bank checks. So they have guaranteed that in writing um, and I would expect them to carry through on that? Yeah, and I think, you know, honoring those checks 
goes back to that guiding principle, which is they're trying to sell these assets. They don't want it to look, um, uh, look they don't want it to look bad at this point. They want to instill confidence. They want to maximize the value of the assets. They're not going to do that by bouncing checks. Right. Well, on that note, uh, I'd like to thank everybody for attending and uh, uh, come back and uh, check out our web page. And um, uh, we look forward to speaking with you in the future. Take care.